Now it's time for another Board Game Brawl preview with Nick Meenahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. Hey folks, my name is Nick, this is Board Game Brawl, and today we're going to be taking a look at a game that is currently seeking funding on Kickstarter. That game is called Council of Blackthorn from Great Northern Games. Now, if you like what you see throughout the rest of this preview video, I'm going to encourage you to go to the official Kickstarter project page. You can follow the link up in the top corner of the screen. Also, in the description section underneath this video, that will take you to the page. Find out more information than I could possibly tell you here, and hopefully you'll consider backing the project. Now, Council of Blackthorn takes place in a medieval fantasy world, or mainly just medieval, there's not a ton of fantasy in the game, where you take control of one of the titular council members of Blackthorn, and you are trying to manipulate action, political action behind the scenes. There's the king and his council, and that's who you are, and you are trying to secretly manipulate things in your favor so that you can gain the most influence and therefore power. But that's a dangerous game to play. And influencing all these different aspects of the kingdom, you might be gaining some treasonous aspects to yourself. And if those ever come to light, you might be beheaded, which is unfortunate, but hey, those things just kind of happen. Of course, there is more to the game than that, so let me go ahead and give you a brief look at how the game is played with a prototype version of the game. I want to stress that because a lot of the things that you see in this preview may change in the final version. This is just to give you a taste of what the game is like. Then we're going to come back. I'll let you know my final thoughts. Council of Blackthorn is a competitive game for two to six players. Each player takes control of a different council member and will do whatever it takes to gain influence, some of which is kept secret until the end of the game. At the end of any round in which there are three blocked faction scoring tracks, the game ends. Whoever has the most influence at that point is the winner. However, players will also be accumulating treason points during the game, which they keep hidden until the end. Whoever has the most treason points is immediately beheaded and cannot win the game, regardless of their influence score. Every player gets a different character to play, with titles like the Master of Shadows, the Lord of the Tower, and the Queen. Each one has different special abilities that they either start with or that are always on for the duration of the game. For instance, the Master of Shadows can easily get rid of treason cards and doesn't start with any. The Queen starts with extra influence on the Noble track and can manipulate dice and cards. Players must also refer to that player as Your Grace. Every player takes their matching set of tokens and places them at the bottom of each of the four faction tracks, Noble, Peasant, Guild, and Legion, unless they get a bonus like the Queen. Each player starts with three influence points, five cards from the faction deck, and three random treason cards, except of course for the Master of Shadows. Treason cards range from zero to three points. You do not want these. Faction cards are much different. They are split into allies, who usually just have one-time effects and then are discarded, and buildings, which can stay in play and give you persistent effects. Faction cards only give you their text effect if you are high enough on one of the tracks. For instance, the king can increase each of your fa faction scores except noble by one when played, but only if you are five or higher on the noble track. This is called the trigger mechanic. Some cards are automatic events called Whispers. The active player plays it immediately and gains a faction level in any faction. Then, every player except the active player must take a Treason card for every track they are ranked first on, and or if they have the most buildings in play. At the beginning of each round, the player with the right hand of the king ring token, the first player, rolls all four of the faction D6s, which are special. They only have two one sides, two two sides, one three side, and one zero side. These dice are then placed next to each faction whose color it matches. We'll get back to that in a minute. Each round, starting with the right hand of the king, each player takes their entire turn, which consists of five phases. In phase one, you complete building construction. If you had played a building the previous turn, it was placed sideways and considered under construction. Now it is righted, and the full building text is in effect. In phase two, you may invoke one and only one action. Actions are specifically stated in bold on character placards and buildings. Not every character or building has one of these. In phase three, you may play one and only one card. If it's a Whispers card, just do as I described before. If it's a faction card, you must do two things in order, the dice effect and then the text effect, if it's triggered as I described before. Look at the die of the faction that is associated with your card and do its effect. 
On a zero, you choose one player who must take a random treason card from you. On a one or two, gain that many levels in the applicable faction. On a three, you gain three levels, but you must also draw a treason card. Note that after you get to track level 5, the levels jump up further than one per level. So, if you move two spaces from level 5, you actually end up on level 9. Also important to note, if a player reaches level 13, the highest level on any of the tracks, that track is now blocked. Every other player must stop on level 9 of that track from here on out, unless they have a special ability that lets them bump the leader. Then, you resolve the text effect after you resolve the dice effect, if possible. Remember, buildings come into play under construction at first. Dice also affect any of these cards. If there's a zero on the die, you auto-trigger the card, regardless of your score. But on a three, no matter what, the card is not triggered. And if it's a building, it's immediately discarded and not under construction. Then you move on to phase three, where you draw back up to five cards. Before you do that, you may discard a card. Finally, in Phase 4, you score. You gain two influence points for every track that you lead on. If there's a tie, every tied player gets one point. Then, if you have the most buildings in play, you score another two points, or one for a tie. As stated before, if three faction tracks are blocked at this point at the end of someone's turn, the game is going to end at the end of the current round. That means that all players get the same number of turns. At that end, you get points for all the tokens you've collected, the sum of all of your faction levels, and the full value of every built building, but only two points for every building that's still under construction. Only after you have done all of this scoring do you, one by one, starting with the lowest scoring player, reveal your treason cards. You add up all of the points, and the most treasonous players, or tied treasonous players, are beheaded and cannot win the game. It's possible for everyone to get beheaded, Whoever is still alive at that point and has the most points, with treason points being the tiebreaker, is the winner of the game. Now, let's get to my final thoughts. Now, the most notable thing about Council of Blackthorn is, of course, the whole treason aspect, which is embedded throughout the entire game. You're constantly in danger of taking treason. Some of the treason cards are just zero, so that's not too bad. And you never quite know if the other players who seem like they have a lot of treason actually have a lot of zeros. So you might feel very comfortable that you've only got a few two or three treason cards, but don't be, because it might come back to blow up in your face. This is actually a mechanism I haven't seen since uh, Cleopatra in the Society of Architects, and it's a mechanism that I enjoyed in that game, and I think it's very interesting here as well, because you can be doing incredibly well, but if by doing incredibly well in influence points, the main way you win the game, you might have been taking too much treason. So that's an interesting equalizer within the scope of the game. It's also interesting the whole uh, trigger mechanism, which is where you can get these faction cards and you can use them, but you may not be able to actually use their printed effect. You could always use the dice effect, which will hopefully get you up on the tracks, which are the important integral aspect of the game in order to uh, get as much influence as possible but it may not have its other printed effects. So you need to decide, is it worth it to play this card now or to play something else? You only get one card and one action per turn. Speaking of those actions, the main way you're gonna do actions is with the different characters, and that's always a good thing in the game. When you have um, every player feeling distinctly different than the others, because in Council of Blackthorn, not only do you have a special action, you've got a bunch of different ways that you're different, including your starting setup and what you start off with or don't start off with, in the case of the Mask of Shadows, or the Shadows, um, who uh, you, you feel very different than all the other players right from the get-go. So I think it's interesting that you not only feel distinct from the start of the game, but that will sort of compound as the game goes on. And you'll have to tailor your play strategy to that and decide which routes and avenues you want to go on based on what your character can actually do. And at the same time, you're avoiding treason as best you can, trying to give treason away to other players and trying to build as many buildings. That's a whole other aspect of the game I didn't even touch on yet, where you can build these buildings which are going to be worth points, but also have persistent effects. And you don't have to focus on that if you don't want to. Maybe you prefer to focus explicitly on the tracks. Just do that. Try to do your best there and hope that you don't get blocked out before the other players can get to the tops of those tracks. And of course, by moving up the tracks, 
you make your cards more effective. So there's a lot of plates in the air in this game, but I think they're all very interesting. And I think that people who are into uh, resource management games, resource efficiency games, um, games with card and hand management, but also who want that sort of um, the, the treason aspect that has a little bit of an edge to the game that a lot of other games don't have, where it's just straight up whoever has the most points at the end. This one has a whole other thing that you have to worry about that adds a lot of intrigue to the game. So if any of those things sound like they appeal to you, you should definitely go to the Kickstarter page. It's running right now. You can find out more information and hopefully you'll consider backing Council of Blackthorn from Great Northern Games. Thank you so much for watching. Take care. Thanks for watching. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. And make sure to check out our sponsor, Board Game Bliss, where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world. BoardGameBliss.com. Thanks for your support.